Hey everyone, welcome to episode 3 of Self Esteem, where this week I'm talking to director, musician and photographer Dan Broadley. Now you may have already come across Dan's incredible work without even realising it. His music videos for Megastars have been viewed countless times, and his band Meadowlark have received over 100 million streams online. So of course we question what success really means in the creative industries. We also reflect on Dan's early exploration with documentary filmmaking and discover how this honest portrayal of the everyday has provided him with an outlet of self-expression that has supported him throughout his whole life. So my name's Daniel Broadley. Uh, I am a filmmaker who lives in the southwest of England. Um, I'm kind of predominantly known for music videos, but I do commercial work. And as a side hustle, I'm also a kind of full-time musician as well uh, in a project called Meadowlark which has had somewhere over 100 million streams now on Spotify. Um, and is it that yeah. much? Yeah. I didn't realize it was that much. That's yeah. sick. Yeah, which is crazy, which is like, you know, it's a machine that just keeps keeps ticking. So, Would you also consider yourself a photographer? Yeah, but definitely as a hobby. Like, this is interesting to get into this straight away, but um, I guess create when you make creativity your job, after a while, you sort of lose sight of like the the hobbyist in you that just did uh-huh. it because you loved it because you're acquiring income and also everything feels like it needs monetization. So like suddenly, if you're creating stuff and you're not, it's not being monetized or you're not using the advertisements or anything like that, it kind of feels like why am I doing it? Which is a really bad way to you know to think about your own creativity. And I think photography for me is like sacred. And I've done okay. a couple of jobs where I have done paid photography gigs, but I'm like really conscious not to make that. A thing so i have something when i'm when i'm like stressed with film work and and music's go, not going my way i need something else to dive into that's still creative and if those two things music and film are like causing me headaches i can't use those as like an outlet because they're the cause of the stress so photography is that for me it's like a completely yeah sacred creative hobby <laughs> I love that word sacred. I mm. think that's that's a that's a great way to describe it. As a bit of context, you and I have known each other for well over ten years. Oh, well over, probably more like 15, 15 years. I think, yeah. Yeah. So we used to be in a band together back in the day, mm-hmm. years and years ago. Yes, we did. Um, I know a lot about your kind of creativity from that, and music was the kind of first way that, that we met. Um, mm. Well, actually, also film. You you were definitely pursuing the film stuff at the time that we met. Yes. Give us a little bit of background on your your creative journey. Where did it start? How has that been? And kind of where, where have you got to now with that? Yeah, totally. I mean, I guess like a lot of other filmmakers, it, probably, it started really with like skate videos or skate films. So I was, I was really into rollerblading, which sounds weird to say, aggressive rollerblading. And uh, that was kind of my thing. And I think um, it probably started with, I guess, vanity maybe. It was like just the idea of filming me and my friends doing the tricks we were learning. And then you start watching skate films and you think, well, you, you strive to be that, that to us was our celebrity, you know, like these, these like massive skaters who in hindsight, you know, weren't probably even making a living from skating, but the, they were like our idols. And so they were on skate films and you'd buy the skate films. And I think the idea of becoming that was like, well, we need to make our skate films and they need to look as good as those skate films. So you buy a camera and you know, it starts off just filming your mates. And then it's like, you, you know, you get your first software, probably Windows Movie Maker, and you start putting the clips in and putting your favorite songs on. And before you know it, you start getting a sense of rhythm and cutting, and you think, actually, this is kind of really fun. And for me, that's eventually what took over was like, I'm, I'm having more fun filming the skating than I am doing the skating. Um, so you I were, just, I never saw you without your like DV cam. Yeah, the little handy cam, right? That was the first yeah. one. Actually, it wasn't me that got it. My, my little brother brought that. Um, I think probably because I was always getting skates or guitars and things for for birthdays and uh, or Christmases or whatever. It was always like so. I buy. We definitely needed a camera in the family, and my brother didn't have any hobbies, so it was like, how about you buy the camera and come with us and film me and my friends skating? Which he lost interest in after about once or twice. But it meant the camera was at home all the time, and I'd take it out. It's a bit cheeky, really. Um, and yeah, I always had it. I had it in my hand all the time. I think that's the thing. Like. It's so odd to think that in this day and age, right, the whole idea of TikTok and, and uh, self-blogging and stuff, I was kind of doing that back then before like mobile phones really captured video, just filming everything, filming parties or 
gigs we were playing or skate films or everything. I just documented all, everything all the time. I loved capturing and sharing it and editing those things together. And um, it's funny because now I would, I'd be doing it on an iPhone if I had an iPhone with me. So but that's a different, different time. Um, but it was done in, in a way where you were very much part of that. It was, it was you and your mates. It was, it was us at points. Like, what, what was that? Was it, what were you, cause you weren't using them for anything, right? You weren't putting them anywhere. You were putting, we started putting them on YouTube at one point. Yeah. But again, really, it was like YouTube was in its infancy and it wasn't really, there was no sense of like what the reason was to put it there. It was much more about having something for me and my friends to watch together than it was about giving it to a world and, and giving that out to loads of people. Um, you know, there's so many things that I'd make into an edit, show the people around me. And then it'd be like, that's, that was completion for me. That was like, okay, it's done. Um, it was, wasn't until later really that people started monetizing or well, the idea of self-promotion really kicked off through video and through stills and things. I mean, that, that's always been the way, but in a much more personal sense. What did you find about sharing it with other people? Like, why was that the reason for you doing it? Yeah, I don't know. I mean, this is the thing. I've, I've thought a lot about creativity and, and where it, the origin of it or the purpose of it, I guess, in terms of my life. And I think it's always been about self-gratification. It's never really been about, like, gaining that from from other people's approval that's certainly a, a, another stage to creativity is when you start sharing it and that gratif gratification comes from other people but at first it's really about the sense of like i don't know watching your own work or seeing something you've made and getting that self fulfillment of being like wow I, I made that that feels great i really enjoy this and then it's the next level of it is sharing that and other people saying wow i enjoy watching that too and you get the, the no another level of gratification but the it, i think it has to kind of start initially from just you being excited about it. I don't think it ever really works if you're only creating for other people and not for yourself, because I think you don't have a heart in it then. And it's, you can't ride those good and bad moments from, from living a creative life or monetizing creativity, I guess, because it's never a straight shot. It's always, you know, you'll have projects where no one cares what you've done or don't get it or don't understand it. And so if you then didn't get it either because you'd never cared in the first place, then you'll just lose interest. I think there's still got to be something in you that, is like, okay, they, they didn't get it, but this is, you know, I bared myself with my feel about this project and it's not going to put me off trying again and, and going back out there and put myself out there again. So I think, you know, creating these films or picking up the camera was, the initial thought was never like, oh, I'm going to film this because I think, to, you know, this will gather like 100,000 views at some point, somewhere down the line. It was much more about just capturing for the sake of capturing because it gave me self-gratification of taking the camera out and filming and finding moments. And I don't know, that's, that's, to me, it felt really important at the time. And it's only now I, I think it's evolved beyond that because there's other levels of, you know, of approval, I guess, or people just all, all gaining some self-worth from your art. Well, I guess when it becomes a vocation mm. outside of just self-expression, that's where it changes, right? Yeah. I, I really like that idea of it's it's for you. And mm. I, it was really interesting, the, the episode that I'd recorded before this with... Um, joe bird we spoke about how creativity doesn't doesn't exist without emotion mm -hmm. it, it's impossible to create with that without yeah. that um and it's interesting that maybe without knowing it it was it was kind of a form of self-expression even if it was just for you to to be documenting that to be creating these kind of i, I guess like vignettes of memories yeah, um, yeah. But, but but then editing them in a way that maybe changes the narrative or highlights certain ways that you were feeling or, or, or heighten certain things. That... Right. Heighten is the, yeah, that's exactly the word then. I think it was heightening. It was the idea of, of like amplifying these moments to something that felt bigger or more important. Um, because to me, they were big moments in my life, but I think when you document them, there's, there's another way to, to expand on that really. You can, the way you cut a film together and the way you show something, a moment. And now my memories of those moments, especially gigs we played, I'm, I'm really thinking back to like, I used to drag the camcorder down to like the White Rabbit in Plymouth and those kind of places and, and, yep. and those kind of video blogs I was making at the time. My memory now is just, it's solely based on those films. I don't really have a memory outside of those. And I, I'd be surprised if I even would remember those gigs at all if there wasn't some kind of documentation of it. You know, I was dressing up on New Year's Eve for one of the gigs we played or like for all these little things that I think, I, I guess to some degree is is just documentation. Yeah, it's the idea of like if, keeping those memories, but also having a version of them, which to me felt like the best version they could be, the best type of memory it could be. Um, and it's interesting that 
specifically that's done through through film because yes. well i mean it's so visceral anyway mm. and it's it's such a direct reflection of what was actually happening i mean i agree with you i don't think there's very key memories that i have with you mm. that are cemented in those videos yeah yeah that i could probably still find if i went back on youtube mm -hmm. and my i think my memory is the video mm -hmm. i actually don't think it's like what was actually happening and i think elevating those memories in a certain way you're almost kind of like retelling certain parts of life um almost as a way to remember them better yeah well you're probably i mean we're similar ages right i mean we, we grew up with parents having suitcases full of old photographs you know because yep. that was what you had people they just printed photographs out and that's the only way they were documented they weren't on hard drives and memory sticks and dropbox folders they were just in bags or boxes or whatever it is sometimes organized sometimes just chaotically collected and I think, you know, we, we grew up in an era where that was important to, to document, you know, it was like parents always, you always grew up with some kind of documentation. I'm sure their generation or the generation before was different because it was expensive to have cameras and it was expensive, but we were in that real change of like the digital age of like, uh, either it was, you know, disposable cameras or original film cameras that were cheap at that point, or there was the first revolution of digital stuff, which is, yeah, you know, uh, camcorders and, and that kind of thing. So I... For me, it didn't feel that alien to pick up cameras and and and, and hoard footage and and collect it. Really, the the generation before that, like you said, maybe they uh, cameras were a bit expensive, but it would have been letters. Yes. It, again, it's it's all memory, right? It's all memories. Right. It's all it's all emotion. Yeah. And it's interesting, kind of that transition of how technology impacts that as well. Because, like you say at the start, you you first and foremost identify yourself as a filmmaker. Yeah. Yeah. Do you think that that's impacted by the way you pursued creativity when you first started yeah definitely i think um i'm not someone really who could ever really do something that i wasn't passionate about you know and that maybe in, in life has left me in a place where i don't earn as much money as other people do because i'm quite selective about what i take on it, it has to feed my soul for me to want to do it and i think it definitely starts off in you know those key moments of adolescence where I picked up a camera and picked up a guitar. Those are still with me now. That's what I kind of pursue and do. And everything else is some kind of, you know, you can almost trace it back and it's some kind of extension of those choices I made back then. Um, yeah. And I think you're right about emotion driving all of it. I mean, it's, I think back to all of those memories that I caught and that, that is, that can only be the motivation really is, is, is the idea of emotion of capturing for that reason. So. Um, of feeling something and finding a way to hold on to that yeah wanting to remember it wanting to hold it wanting to keep it and and actually now i mean i haven't been through them for a long time i have boxes and boxes of these dv tapes that you know at the time i couldn't there was too much really to transfer to computers because it's like it would have been gigabytes yeah. back then which was you know that was you didn't have like hard drives just flowing around with loads of space on them so a lot of them just remained on the dv tape so and i've never gone back and i don't think i have a way to watch them now but you know they're, they're there they're archived they're, i don't think they've perished at all so and I, I have no will to throw those away. They're still really important to me. And I'm sure on them one day I'll go through and relive those moments again. And I'll remember why I did it in the first place. And, um, you should definitely get them out and find a way. DV cams are back in fashion. Forget TikTok. They, yeah. they want DV footage uploaded now. So I mean, to be fair, I've had a couple of DV cams on a few different shoots in recent years because of that nostalgia they follow. You know, obviously originally it is, it was yeah. like eight mil cameras and stuff. But really, the reality is like we all remember growing up in the DV tape era when, and that kind of like semi squiff looking digital footage. So, and people really want to kind of indulge in that again now. So it's quite fun to, you know, take those on shoot sometimes. And, and, and you realize that they serve a purpose, you know, for a long time, you know, in college and things, we were using these cameras and I was always thinking like, this isn't as good as what I'm seeing at cinema or on TV. And it was restricted, but actually those cameras and that style of shooting and the image quality has a place. It had a place back then and it has a place now. Because it's so interesting that people would choose now to use a DV camera for a project, right? Yeah. Because they want to be transported back to a feeling. And that's like, again, that, that footage has that feeling. You could probably shoot it digital and make it look like that, but it won't be the same. We remember things in a certain way. And those kind of cameras really, really take us back to that. Same reason people shoot like old plate photography and things still, you know, it's like they want to, you could easily create, create the effect of that with digital and lots of editing, but there's something about it, you know? It's not the real thing though, right? And exactly. it's so interesting that you you say that. I was just when you when you were talking then I was just thinking back to 
the memories that I've got from those times Mm -hmm. and the memories that I've got are of the DV tape version of what existed Mm -hmm. because of those videos that we watched and that, that were kind of shared around. Like I don't, I don't really remember seeing them as real life. I remember seeing them through that kind of nostalgic lens of rewatching them. Yes, exactly that. And I think it's really important. And it's the same with photography and everything else that lenses and film stock and type of camera shooting on, they all inform something. They all inform part of the image and, and part of the feeling. You know, a lot of people would argue a long time, like it doesn't matter what you shoot on. It doesn't matter the lens, it doesn't matter the stock to shoot. And it's like, all of it creates a feeling and an emotion. And um, and right down to like, yeah, something that's purposefully lo-fi, essentially, which back then wasn't lo-fi. It was just a consumer camera. But now we see we see it as lo-fi. But the reality is it's just, a, it's nostalgia. And we crave that now. Yeah. Um, so it's, yeah. It's well, especially nice. after lockdown and COVID and all those sorts of things, I yeah. think that that need for again, that need for feeling mm-hmm. and connection as well. I think a, a lot of what you get through those through those videos and the emotions they bring up is you you get a sense of connection, even if you're not with people. You remember what it felt to to be connected with people. This is kind of you know, sort of some weird film therapy now, but I've never really thought about it. But my style is completely informed by those early you know, uh, shooting experiences because I'm not someone who does a, a lot of post-production in terms of like shoot for CGI or anything like that. For me, it's about capturing a moment there and then. And a good example of that would be something like when I shot my, the, probably the biggest music video I've ever done was for Nick Jonas back in 2021, I guess. And um, that is so tactile and so tangible. that His videos are very much like usually these big anthemic pop videos that are full of effects and full of lots of post-production but my take on it was like wanting to be in the room minimal crew i mean it was lots of crew but it, like the idea the feel of it being a camera in a room with a person and that setting is is exactly as you see it and it's about exploring the space with a person and that's re- in reality that's all i've ever really done that's kind of like me drawing from those moments right at the very start is just wanting to have people in a space and show that exactly as it is and then or enhance it you know, it was never about faking it or going beyond what the room just had inside it. It was about just enhancing what was already there and not going any further. I don't know if that makes any sense. It's probably it good. makes total sense. And I, I don't even know if it would like you, you picked out the word heighten earlier. And I wonder whether enhance is, is maybe not quite the right angle. I feel mm-hmm. like your, your work is super honest. It's very tactile. It's yeah. very, it's very real. It feels very in the moment. And I wonder whether it's more just using the camera and using your direction to heighten key things of of the the action or 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 whatever whatever's playing out yeah yeah to tell that story in a heightened way yes exactly that yeah but it's always i i give myself that kind of ceiling that, that you know it's if it's not in the room and then i don't particularly want to put it in there you know if it's it's not something i want to get in post production afterwards and say let's fill this with make believe stuff which is totally possible and it's a certain and it's not me looking down on the videos that do that but it's just that doesn't give me that emotional feel you know and i think it's like i want to be i want to feel like i'm in that room with that person i don't want to be taken to outer space or whatever i want to be there Um, well that doesn't feed your soul right and i guess that comes back to this idea of it's about emotion for you it's about feeling it's about evoking those memories or it's i guess it's about playing into that evocation of, of memories that you had from where your love of filmmaking began mm-hmm, mm-hmm. yeah so you, you started in filmmaking at the same time you were um well into music yes kind of carry on from there where did where did it start to kind of progress from yeah. there well the reality is i i sort of so i was into making skate films i only went to college to pursue filmmaking because i needed to kill time to do the band you know, I was in multiple bands, one of which was with you, but there was many before, many after. Mm-hmm. Um, I just needed to kill time and stay in, in the same place. And it, it made sense to me to go and do filmmaking because I could, I already had a skill there and I could quite mi- uh, mindlessly carry on with that whilst really pursuing music, which wasn't going to pay me at that point. Um, but the reality is after a certain amount of time of doing filmmaking as a, um, a degree, eventually it just clicked. It was like, Obviously, I could pass module by module because I was capable of holding a camera and filming. But at some point, the love and the passion came in for it. And I think, I'm not sure which project it was, but it it was quite near the end of my degree. It took a long time to kind of find myself. But by that point, I just didn't really, you know, I didn't even care about music as much at that point. Suddenly, I was I, it, it completely shifted to the other foot. Everything I was getting from playing gigs and playing, making music, 
I was suddenly getting from making films. And it might have been the, the DSLR revolution. It might have been right at the end because we were using cameras in college that just weren't very good. And it was quite frustrating right. to not be able to create the images you had in your head with the tools you had. And by the time I came to the end of my degree, I think the first person had used a 5D Mark II as a film, you know, as a filmmaking tool um, because it had a, um, a HD video setting on it. And it meant that was my first. That was my first stills camera. Right. It's a great. It's still a great camera now. Still it's, a great camera. Yeah. yeah. It has such a great look to it. And I think suddenly you could use photographic lenses, which is much more akin to like you know cinema and using cinema lenses, creating depth of field and creating like very sort of organic looking imagery images which you couldn't do with the kit we had at college so i was like wow suddenly like my whole all my visions out of my head i could execute to the same degree they were you know i was imagining them yeah. um and i think that changed everything for me that was like you know it was this consumer tool i had which made things look like they were hollywood films at the time i thought anyway i mean i'm sure if i look back at them they were pretty terrible but it definitely got me closer and then from then i just um it, that coincided with me finishing my degree and I was working in HMV at the time, and I really recognised that I didn't get any love for working in retail, or you know, and, and sort of, I really wanted to just progress and pursue a career very quickly. I didn't want to wait around or work my way up from the bottom. It was like, look, I've got this tool, I've, I can create images I really like on this, and other people were telling me they really enjoy the images too. Why yeah. don't I just go for it? And I started. Um, I charged the first band fifty pounds for a video. And then they told two of their friends who were in bands and then they came to me and I doubled it. I just kept doubling my fee as people were coming to me to ask for, for videos until at some point I hit a price. I'm not sure what that was, maybe 800 pounds or something where the bands were saying like, oh, I'm not sure we can afford Can't that. Afford that. That's, that's the shelf, that's the ceiling. Yeah. Um, and, it, and it was also, it coincided with the YouTube boom. It was suddenly like at that point then bands wanted a music video. It wasn't, it was before TikTok, it's before Instagram. It was MTV really, generation, right? Well, I guess it was kind of, it was the post MySpace generation and Facebook hadn't really figured out how to, how to work for bands yet or for, for musicians. So there was a bit of a dead space of like, where do we promote ourselves? And so bands decided it was YouTube. And at that point it wasn't about, it was less about video blogs and DIY content. And it was much more about having flashy music videos that looked like they could, they belonged on MTV or Kerrang or whatever. And so I, that yeah. just coincided at the perfect time for me. I graduated, had my own kit. You know, I was sort of like very, I could get quite good looking videos without putting much, I, I, you know, I didn't need studios and lights and things. I'd just drag a band up to Dartmoor during sunset and shoot on a cliff side. And that looked like as good as it would if you'd shot it, you know, in, in, on a, an amazing camera. You know, if you're on it, if you're using natural light, there's not, the tools doesn't really change that that much, you know, the time of day and the setting no matter what you shoot on, are going to look like that. You know, it's obviously color grading and the sensor are going to help a little bit and the lenses, but generally speaking, you can trick your audience to believe it's a much more high-end piece if you get those two things right, the setting and natural. Yeah. Light. I mean, we've just spoken about your approach to filmmaking now, yeah. even with some of your biggest pieces, and it's it's like that is literally what you were doing then. Yeah. yeah. And that, that was because you didn't have the money to like go and do all this fancy stuff. It was but... a complete out of necessity, yeah. But it was, I think it was a good thing to have. It taught me a lot about how to make a lot with a with very small amount um and i and i just i still really like that approach now I've, some of my favorite jobs are when there's like a minimal crew and we're just kind of traipsing into the wild and it's kind of seeing what happens we have a plan but it's like that plan could easily be you know changed because you have the elements to deal with and you have a very real world setting to deal with and um yeah it's it's very interesting how i mean this is the first time i've really processed this in terms of like a linear journey and it all adding up together. I, I always assumed that at some point I just sort of sw switched to the other tracks, but really it's the same, same train track, same journey. This is what these conversations are, mm. um, are for. I, I also think that we underestimate how much of a story there is to tell mm -hmm. because of how much technology and how much of, a, of an advancement there's been in, in kind of image making. Yeah. You know, it, yes, fine escapism and and kind of elevation is great if you like that mm -hmm. i think obviously you're kind of drawing on key memories and key experiences that have helped yeah. you kind of carve out this kind of creative perspective but you don't need all of that flashy stuff like literally being in like you say location light 
the people that you're with, the story mm. you're trying to tell, mm. the music you're trying to set it to, if it's for a music video, for instance, yeah. there's so much within that in itself mm. at a baseline level. Why try and forget all of that and turn it into something else when actually you've got everything that you need already there? Well, that's it. But then it's this is where it becomes, you know, you're affected by the filmmakers already out there, all the, all the creatives, the artists out there. And I think it's very easy to think that you're doing the wrong thing or that you should be doing what your peers are doing. And I think we've all had different journeys, right? So it's, it's, I'm very guilty of looking at what I do and not seeing necessarily the worth in it as much as I see it in other people's work. Um, and I, you know, I have this thing, I still have it now really where I often hate projects. So when a project's completed, I often hate that project for about six months, like the, the final piece of work. I'm like not into it. I think it's just a bad piece of work. And then six months later, I usually forget about all the trauma of the shoot or the things that went wrong or the things we didn't capture. Right. Okay. And I get to watch it again. And then I'm like, actually, this is a great piece of work. And it does represent me as a filmmaker and as an artist. But it takes a long time to forget the kind of those moments that, you know. I mean, it's really easy to be self deprecating, especially when it comes to creativity. Mm -hmm. I think if you could go back to the freedom that you had in those first days where you were just making those DV cam skate films and and mm -hmm. kind of and docs there was there were no parameters in which to create it was it was completely up to you and i think mm. kind of nice linear kind of segue into kind of where you're at now and, and kind of turning this into more of a profession and a vocation rather mm. than a hobby but it is really hard to not look at other people's work and to not look at what's what the trends are and what what's deemed to have currency and value mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and then self-deprecate against that. And, and then almost sometimes change your work or yourself to try and fit in because you want to make money. We all need to make money. Mm -hmm. But actually I, I, I think the key comes when actually you don't do that mm -hmm. and you do really follow what you, what you believe to be true and, and kind of soak up all of those things that have inspired you throughout your life and put that into the work. Because that, at that point, that's where, you become unique in your kind of creative output. Exactly that. I mean, nail on the head there. And it's funny that there's been many times along my career so far where I've wanted to jump ship on my style and jump into something else. Or, but it it will never work because it has to come from a place of emotion. It has to come from a place of authenticity. And quite often in the situations, that's when you feel like the most false. You know, it's like when you're trying to copy someone else's style or rip something off, or because you feel like it's going to grant you another avenue and it's been many times over the years much more early on i'd imagine where i've dabbled in other people's styles to try and carve my own way with that thinking that's what's current that's what people want and it's never the right it's never the right thing to do i always end up coming back to like the style that is that originally attracted me you know um, and when you do that i mean i'd go as far as to say i actually don't think you could do that because i i right. genuinely think inside mm -hmm. you you will always be drawn back to to that place because of your experiences mm -hmm. like this idea of i mean I've, I've just kind of put some thoughts together from episode one um with with Aoife where we kind of spoke about creativity as this kind of i don't know how i would describe it this this kind of ever present or kind of omnipresent thing that will do with itself what it wants mm. and help you along the way. Like you're, right. you're always going to be influenced by that. I think your kind of creativity was always destined to be kind of the sum of all of your experiences. Yes. And just putting a veneer across that to try and fit in with mm -hmm. what's happening at the moment mm -hmm. is A, never going to make you happy. No. And B, I, I, I genuinely would, would argue i don't think that you'd be able to stick in it for long and you will always veer back into trying to shoot in those other ways that you've always known and loved because that's what connects with you absolutely i mean yeah you're exactly right and those those are the results that would happen after i'd stray from my own creativity it would always be like okay that didn't work that didn't feel right doesn't feel good and naturally the next project would come along you'd fall back into not necessarily a comfortable space but certainly what you what you know to be true about your creativity right. Um, Were you ever being asked to do another style? Like, was that influencing it or was it just more you pushing yourself because of kind of 
social pressure? Yeah, I think it's probably more myself than anything. Again, I don't, I've always had a bit of an imposter syndrome complex really in terms of like, I don't see the worth in my own work as much as others, as, as I said before. So it's very I think easy. We all have that. Yeah, it definitely. It's, it's, it's prevalent. And the more I've talked to other creators about it, the more I realize that's a really common thing. Um, but equally, that's certainly something which, which would come into play. So I'd be quite susceptible to wanting someone to say, Hey, change it, do it, do, do this differently, do it like this. Because I'd be like, okay, you're guiding me. I'm not left to my own insecurity now you know it's like someone else is saying this is wrong do it like it this. doesn't fall not, on you yeah but no one ever did you know it was like i it was only ever coming from me where i'd say I, maybe i should try something different here my style attracts a certain type of client mm-hmm. um and that's been something you have to accept after a while you know you look, you look at your peers doing certain projects and you think well i'd love to make something like that but it's not it's not on the cards for you necessarily because it's such a stray from what people are coming to you for um and i've learned now to really lean into that is to not try and constantly brush off the people that are coming to you to, to do your style because you want to be doing this other stuff, you know, like really let those people come to you and make work that you both can have a great time making because they already know what you're capable of. So you can easily exceed those expectations by just progressing naturally, but equally you can have a great time because everyone's on the same page. Everyone knows exactly what you're making. They've seen your work, they've seen your portfolio. They know what that's about. The reality is now that's more important to me is having a good time making the thing. You know, it's like, I don't want to have a really miserable time making something and then get to the end and go, well, at least it's a good bit of work, but it took 10 years of my life making it. You know, I want to have a good experience right the way through. So at the point when it comes out, I'm not there like blood, sweat and tears thinking, I hope to God this gets received well because it was such a horrible experience to make. And at least if it does well, that'll give me some ease on it. You know, I, I at yeah. the point it comes out, I'm kind of like, well, now it's for other people because I've had my experience making that and it was great from the get-go all the way through the production into post-production love the whole thing and now it's for everyone else to digest and i can just put my hands up and say you know i've loved that up to that point and whether it's received well or not it doesn't matter because everyone involved just loved it the clients love making it we've all had a great time in post-production like seeing it come together um and that is really like so much more important than screaming your head off on set trying to make something that's impossible and then everyone having a bad time um and i get it that's sometimes the way to make a film and sometimes so the best results come out of those painful experiences, but it doesn't seem worth it to me. To kind of go back to that thing about kind of trying other styles and trying to push yourself into different areas. Again, another reason why I think it wouldn't happen is, is because you're the person in that process and you are the person that's been influenced by all of these things and has lived this creative life to get to that point. Mm-hmm. Just putting a different lens on it can't change all of that baggage that you've got. Right. Exactly. Exactly that. Yeah. I think that's just it. I mean, you, it's kind of like your creative personality, like I said, has come from a long line of learning and there is no way to erase that or to change that really. I mean, you can grow and you can, it can certainly be molded in a certain way, but it has to be part of that journey. It can't, you can't just stop dead and say, I'm starting again here. Um, not without it being false, you know? And I think, and I think people, people see through that in, in, in authenticity, you know? Yeah. And I guess like, yeah, if you then start to try and do that for purely like commercial purposes, I do think that there's a, a very soulless approach to kind of flashy YouTube style videos now where yes. they do lack emotion. I think it's become, it's because people believe there's a formula. And I think that's the issue is that at some point, one of those flashy pieces of work was made and it impressed everyone because it was great and it was original. And it was new. And it was new. Yeah. I and mean, everyone's like, right, that's the formula. Let's copy it. I mean, it happens in music all the time, right? Ed Sheeran gets big and it's like a diamond in the rough. It's like, how is this kind of average dude? He was great, obviously great singing, great songwriter, like suddenly blown up. And then all of a sudden every label was like, right, let's find the next average looking dude with a guitar. And they trial like a hundred different acts. And then none of them succeed because at that point it's an old formula. It's like, it's not going to work again. It's, you're not going to hit magic twice. And I think the same thing with, with creativity is that people will see something that does well and go, right, let's all do it. Let's all do it like that person did it. Cause they've just got like a billion views on that thing. And like, we could do that. A lot of people in high positions who aren't creative from a business side of things that run a creative business don't realize that they think well surely creativity is like anything else they think about it logically well that thing did well and it's creative and it's that way so we can do the same thing but the reality is that the people that make the changes are people like us right people who, who create are out of emotion and, and there are some of a very unique set of events throughout your life that have created this certain style yeah that will become the thing i mean look at the, the daniels and um they made everything everywhere all at once, right? It's just like swept the Oscars. 
those two guys started like making videos back in the day. I've been a big fan of them for years. They did a Manchester Orchestra video. That's blown up now because that is just purely, I mean, if you watch any of their music videos, you'd be like, well, that's the same guys that made everything ever all at once, right? It's, it's the same style. It's come through over the last 10, 15 years of them making films. Mm-hmm. And now it's been recognized. And I guarantee you now from this, we're going to see a surge of like quite wacky action meets drama meets, you know, surrealism films that are going to come out with similar sort of like long titles and, you know, and, and similar cast. Mm-hmm. But the reality is, no, you can't copy that. And no one would have predicted it because that's the sum of those guys. Uh, so some you know, of their experience. Yeah. And, yeah. Their, and their creative soul, their emotional creative soul is in that film. And it's just, it's just interesting. It's an interesting observation, you know, um, and everyone's really excited about it because it's, it is unique because those guys aren't chasing a bit, you know, they're not trying to make a Marvel formulaic film or something. They're just doing what they do. They made that film for, for not a lot of money without the intention of it becoming big. And now it's the zeitgeist is huge and everyone's jumping on it. And it's incredible to see it pay off when you stick to your own creativity and you, and you, you don't try and become, whatever like like everything else is doing you know it's like you just do the thing you do and do it really well and at some point hopefully like for them it gets recognized and and becomes that phenomenon that you would always hope it would be this whole idea of what success looks like to you and what that means i think you know we're in this generation now where you know the catalyst of social media has really kind of has has pushed this kind of social proofing and social acceptance onto creativity which i mm. i think is actually quite problematic in itself yes I um is getting a billion views success like okay fine it's going to make you money fine it's going to get your name out there fine yes there's the literal version of i guess success within a career of being successful mm-hmm. getting regular work getting a yeah. uh getting a sense of notoriety but like if that's always if that if that's always striving for like What's the point? Well, also, you're going to be forever chasing a, a moving goalpost. Because um, it changes because of trends. Trends. And trends are set by the people yeah. who are being honest to themselves. Yeah. If your work's being noticed and that gives you some sense of purpose, just sit with it. Enjoy that for a moment, you know, because rather than a lot of people stress about how to do it again, how to keep going. I mean, I see it on TikTok all the time. People are like, I've been viral 10 times this week and now the agri- algorithm's changed and I don't know what to do. And it's like, just don't worry about it. Like, why have you got to keep topping that? You know, I guess maybe from a career sense, but I imagine it's losing its, uh, it's, it's losing its zest, you know, the idea of the, the, yeah. the feeling of achievement. Well, and I, I, I just, I feel really sorry for the people that think that and go, the algorithm's changed. Like, what am I going to do? And it's mm. like, why are you worried? Like, let's let's not worry about kind of seeking admiration from everybody, and let's try yes. getting some more admiration from ourselves, and yes. really kind of paying attention to that. This exactly comes back to that thing where I think it's a worry that if people have got into creativity in a sort of career, like if they've chosen creativity as a career rather than mm-hmm. let it come to them naturally because they just enjoy creativity and it's granted them money in some capacity. If you just jump into it with like. My only goal from doing anything creative is to make money from it. It's such a not dangerous game to play because you'll never, you will just be chasing yeah. success. Or and everyone's idea of success is different, right? I think, I think goals can't be a source of happiness, right? Like, or the idea of people think that by getting a billion views or going viral is going to make them happy. It doesn't. It won't. They'll get the dopamine rush for five minutes whilst everyone's saying how amazing they are, but it's like it wear off pretty quickly, and that come down is is insane. Really, you ha- like goals should be goals. Goals should be things that are like, you know, the milestones, like achievements. Yeah, exactly. But the happiness, yeah. happiness should only come from self-generated moments, right? It's things that no one externally has any control of. Even if that's as simple as making a coffee and sitting by the window with a book, and letting the sun come through, and it's like that's a controllable thing that makes you feel happy. Going for a walk in the park, you can control that, right? Yeah. It's like these little things that you have control over, that's your source of happiness. So then all the goals, all these big moments in life, these big views or big gigs or whatever it is you're doing in creativity are just that. They're just moments, high moments that you can be like, wow, that was great. But it's not my source of happiness because if it is, you're just going to be chasing that constantly and it's going to be more disappointing as if for any reason, yeah, the algorithm changes and suddenly the style of content you make isn't popular anymore, then what? You're not happy anymore? That sucks. Like, yeah, find another way to be happy and then that stuff, because you'll evolve. We change, right? You might, you're a photographer now. 
and well, many facets, same as me, I'm a filmmaker with many facets. At some point, the whole world might change and we, they just don't need us anymore to make that kind of content, right? Or it's not yeah. monetized anymore. And we'll just figure it out, we'll change it. We'll just do something else. We'll figure out somewhere along the line, you know, we're not going to spend our whole lives miserable about that because we'll adapt. And like, I don't know if you're anything like me, but happiness can't come from the thing I'm doing in a career because it's it's too fickle. It's too like, uh, it's too fragile. I I absolutely agree. Um, trying to, conflating happiness and success with career in creativity, to me, I just, I think I've learned over the years and especially recently uh, through doing this and through having a lot of conversations with people, I've come to understand for myself, like they are very different things. Yes. I, I'm really interested to know the difference or what you see the difference between your professional creativity and your personal creativity yeah i mean for me i when i first started i struggled with collaboration a lot i was kind of like a lone warrior i just go out and like you know i really didn't want to collaborate with classmates i didn't want anyone to kind of bring me down or like stop my vision and I, it was quite okay. problematic because when it came to a point in my career where i couldn't do it all at once i had to start bringing crew on board i really struggled with that relationship but now for me that's like the joy of it it's who I have on set with me. It's those moments. So professional creativity, what I get from that is the collaborative side of it. I love that. I love it with, with crew. I love it with client. I love making something with them. Um, and I love that because that's how I remove myself from it in a way that feels too personal. And, and it doesn't feel like a failure every time if I don't exceed my own expectations, which are always way too big. You know, it's like they're just impossible to reach. But then vice versa, it means in my own time, I can like find solitude for my own personal creativity. That to me is very personal. That's without any influence from the outside. That's no collaboration. That's me just finding a moment, whether it's out of my point and shoot on 35 mil film, just waiting, seeing if a moment happens. If it doesn't, just enjoying a setting or enjoy being around people. It's, and I've, I've made it quite clear with myself that that's the way to distinguish it is to share my creativity in professional capacities and keep it for myself for my own personal what i'm noticing the more that i talk to people and the more i analyze where my thoughts have been over the kind of past however many years we definitely see creativity as a physical thing that exists yeah. and i don't believe that it is that now i mean i think for me i think that's a misconception that's that's happened a lot and i think mm. we see that end product and what we actually put into the space as creativity. Yeah. But actually, you know, the mindset of being creative, of problem solving, of birthing an idea, of using that to better how we feel, like those are all creative ways of thinking as well and and, and creativity in itself. And I think this, this, there's a problem, especially in a professional capacity, that creativity is about the end product. Mm -hmm. We get really hung up on that. We put all of our effort into what's it going to be at the end. You know, we have all of these amazing moments, frustrating moments to get to this one thing because we're selling it, because it's making us money. Mm -hmm. um, that actually, we're forgetting that, yeah, that's great. And there's a lot of fun within that. And there's a lot of purpose within that because it means we can earn a living doing what we love. Mm -hmm. But let's not forget about how amazing the, the mental act of creativity is as well a side of that. And I think yeah. you using photography as this kind of sanctuary outside of that, yes, fair enough, the photography is physical, but your mindset and, and the way that you're using that to slow down and mm -hmm. to pay attention to yourself in itself is a creative act. Yeah, I agree. And it's interesting you say that about how we measure creativity and because the reality is some of the greatest creatives in the world are multifaceted and how is it that someone can go from, you know, um, I guess different types of art or different outputs and still have their creative voice and it can still show through writing, through photography, through filmmaking, through whatever it yeah. is they're doing. Um, and that's a good example. You know, it, I mean, on a very sort of like limited scale, you see things like when a big director who does blockbuster films goes and, do, goes and does a television series and everyone's like, wow, this, the series is as good as the film. And it's like, well, cause that person could do anything because their creativity is, is insular it's them it's how they express it could fit any format really it's like their voice doesn't it's not about the final output it's about everything you're exactly right leading up to it all the decision and it's it's limitless as well and mm -hmm. i think we 
we consistently put limits on ourselves because we we don't stop to realize that creativity isn't just getting to this one end goal. It's actually, it's a mindset. It's, it's a way of thinking. Mm. It's a way of being. Mm. And it's actually something that I believe we all have. There's so many people I speak to are like, no, I'm not creative. I'm not creative. Mm. No, I can't, can't do that. And I'm just like, we were, we were all born as creative beings. Yeah. You just need to come to that realization and find that way to understand that actually it doesn't matter. You like, you, you don't have to be good at drawing. You don't have to be no. great at taking a, a photograph. Being a photographer it is, a, is a learned skill. Mm. It's what you then add on top of that that makes it a creative mm. act. I think it's interesting. I, yeah, everything you're saying is exactly right. And I think the reason people do not pursue creativity is because of the fear of failure. We, there's Absolutely. such a thing with, uh, with, especially in our sort of more capitalist society, that failure is bad. But failure and creativity is the, it go hand in hand. You, you, learn, you don't learn anything when you get it right. You make something and you're like, what? Well, you get to the, that last day and you, you hand it in. You're like, well, how do we get here? You know, because it's just such a, a flowing experience. Yeah. But, and, you, and you don't really learn anything from that. You just think, well, I got to try and do that again now. Like, I don't know how, how we did this the first time. But when you fail, my God, you learn everything. You, you're like, you know, in, that, in those moments and it, they're low moments, but you get so much from it. I, my biggest advice to anyone would be go and fail. Go out there and just fail at something because you will learn. And as long as you're persistent and you're you have courage to carry on, like you'll you'll get so much from that. Failure has very negative connotations, and I think we need to try and take that out of it. I think that's exactly. like you. Failure is not a negative. It's thing. not negative. Failure, yeah, no. failure doesn't need to be negative. Failure can be negative if you allow it. If you if you stop, if you stop at failure, and it's negative, right? But progressing beyond failure is what is 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 the kind of I don't know. I guess the uh, the most forward way of becoming successful do you remember your first memory of feeling that you needed creativity in your life i mean probably at the point before it became a career i think i needed i needed a sign i was pretty like unsure of what i wanted in life you know music obviously is not going to suddenly just pay you loads of money especially the kind of music i was making and i was aware of that you know as much as i wanted to live the dream of touring and playing big shows and things like i was quite aware that like all my peers or people I looked up to also weren't making money out of this thing mm -hmm. many years ahead of me at that point where I needed something in life to give me some direction that was going to give me some monetary uh, security, I suppose, to some degree creativity kind of stepped in there. And that was when that was the switch between I was just doing filmmaking at university to kill time whilst I was doing music. Suddenly it was like, Oh, wait a minute. This is like really important and something I need to now really nurture in this last year which it was, it was like the last year of university where suddenly it clicked and it was like, okay, this is, I think I need, I need this in my life now more than I need the music because this is actually going to, there's a very clear path of where this could end up that's positive. And with music, it was pretty obvious that unless you get, it's like a lottery ticket. I think with music, it's certainly one of the sole factors. If you've got the skill that gets you like up to the first floor of the building and then luck gets you to the penthouse, you know, it's like, how many streams on Spotify have you got now? Over 100 million now. Like, if you were to tell yourself when we mm -hmm. were back in that band that we were going to have 100 million streams on, well, MySpace, because Spotify didn't exist at that yeah, point, yeah. you would have been like, absolutely no way. Yeah. Like, dreams. Whereas now that's actually happening. Yeah. And I don't, I mean, I'm sure you have taken stock and gone, yeah, fuck, like that is. Oh, it, it's mad. Good. And it's also, again, it's, it's a complete uh, Fugazi. It's not a, a tangible thing. You know, we hit these editorial playlists and obviously the songs have got to be good enough to get to that point yeah. but equally it's completely out of our we haven't you know if anything i don't like that the uh, those streams don't represent any level of success for me in, in a way that feels personal because it is not in my control to have got those it's, it's a lot of luck it's a lot of like relying on a third party thing which is controlled by robots you know it's like algorithmic it's not it's kind of crazy that you're again it's not a safe place to be it's not like a secure income it's just a complete gamble and a, and a great one it's it's a great anecdote and i love i love that i have that under my belt and it and also it informs me as a creative in the sense of being a musician plays into my my filmmaking career hugely but that's not again all of those points that you've just picked out mm. which we was deem as indicators of success yes none of them 
are the creative parts of being a musician. No, no. It's, you, and you that's mad. Hundred million streams is not a creative asset to you. It's it's an accolade. It's it's a thing. It's a result of something you've been creative doing. But it, your creativity is like that's at the point where it's because your piece of art is a commodity. After you've made it and you've released it, it's a commodity, and therefore it's. I don't think it's creative at that point anymore. It's like a the, the creative part is encased in it. But what it goes yeah. and does is is a business decision, right? It's people like throwing it around because it's a it's so far a out of your control as well. Exactly. The bit that you do have control of is the creativity. And that's the one thing I love about songwriting. Out of anything else, it's so deeply, well, you know this because you've written songs before. It's so deeply personal, but it's also how one minute this thing didn't exist. And then you birth this idea and it's like, and you have a, you have a version of it and only you have heard it at that moment. You and whoever's in the room with you making it. And it's insane. You were like this thing in it, like music exists, right? But this version of it didn't exist five minutes ago, not in any capacity. And now it exists. And it's like, and you literally birthed it. You morphed it out of nothing. Aside of your practice and aside of all of the kind of applications of creativity that you've kind of pursued and expressed yourself through, mm -hmm. how has your creativity impacted you personally kind of throughout your life? That is interesting. I mean, it's certainly given me a sense of self-worth. I, I think you always have creativity to lean on. So throughout life, obviously, as, as the older you get, the more trauma you deal with, the more people pass away or breakups or whatever it is you go through in life. Having something always there alongside you consistently is like an amazing thing to have because I think it'd be so easy to lose your way if you create these foundations that then fall apart right relationships family members whatever it is these things mm -hmm. that aren't necessarily stable because life is life and that's what happens you have something which is in your control that you always have to kind of with you and you can always pick it up when you need it or put it down when you need it like it's just there it's like a friend it's like a it's a purpose and it keeps you kind of in line and guided um i don't know what life would look like if i didn't have that if i'd instantly been so I had success through maybe like um, school, you know, doing something more traditional and then going into a career or a job that would never feel safe because you're relying on something else, that, an infrastructure that is not your, in your control. But creativity is in your control. It's in everyone's control. And I think that's a really important thing. If that answers your question, I don't know. <laughs> it completely does. And um, through all of these conversations that I'm having, what I kind of come closer to reminding myself each time is creativity is so much part of us individually but also kind of external to us as well i think like i especially look at creativity as this kind of like in my kind of spiritual mindset mm. that i'm kind of having at the moment this kind of cosmic thing which is kind of like like you just said there for us to draw on when we want it there for us to express ourselves mm. but actually it's it's such a it's such a good thing for us to have as humans yes it's important and you're completely right it's so funny now i'm sort of drawing back to your previous conversation about creativity being a thing like a, like a, like a product yeah. it's not is it it's it you're right. the cosmic thing you said is exactly right it, it's i'm trying to think of what it, the example of it would be we channel it into things that make money and into products and into these pieces of physical but it's not physical at all creativity is not, nothing to do with physical it's both an act and an emotion yes and i don't think you can say that about many other things apart from love right Love is an act and an emotion. I was just about to say that's the thing I'm thinking of, right? Love is, if you said what is love, it's, it's not a thing. It's not. It's not a one act. It's not one anything. It's it's a it's a it's a, a cosmic thing. It's it's intangible. And creativity sits side by side with love. I do truly believe that like it's as important for you humans to have that. You know, mm. you'll, you'll thrive in life if you have an avenue of creativity. It could be literally anything. You know, it's like it could be making little things out of blue tack on the side of your desk. Something which is just not you know it's just a creative outlet it's so important having an understanding and respect of yourself mm -hmm. and allowing yourself to develop and supporting yourself and allowing yourself agency to think and have opinion and have emotion that results in a creative mind that mm -hmm. results in creativity yeah. so i actually think maybe it doesn't exist without that or the one doesn't exist without the other yeah yeah, I agree. I think it's that. Uh, but I think love is so socially accepted in sort of all senses. So it's why everyone has that, I think, and why creativity, I think, is discouraged because of 
I don't know what it, what it is, but creativity for a long time. As we all know, it's that whole fear of like the, your family saying, get a real job, you know, whatever it is, you know, not that we all have that experience, but it's like the, the, that stereotype exists for a reason because people don't deem creativity as important. They think it's like a child thing. It's like you, you kids, you make sandcastles and play forts and stuff. And the reality is creativity is actually super important and probably should be encouraged into our adult lives. I think we'd all be there. It probably solve a lot of problems. Um, but I don't know what exactly, but it feels like it would. So I've got a couple very last quick fire questions. Yeah, What's more important to you, the process of creating or the final product? Uh, the process, always. Yeah. I mean, like well, we definitely covered that in the previous. Yeah. yeah. I, was, I, I already knew the answer to that question. Yeah, yeah. But it's nice to sort of really just, that makes me feel quite self-assured about that answer. <laughs> um, do you think that creativity informs your identity or your identity informs your creativity? I mean, judging by this conversation, I might originally I would have said both, right? To that. Okay. Because they can but I think now actually I think my identity informs my creativity. I think, like I said, going back to the start and thinking about why I picked up the camera in the first place, why I made these those choices, and how that's carried on through everything I've I've done, that to me says my identity, who I am, what I want, the reason I want or have an urge to capture or to document is something I continue to have in my work now. And even in jobs which could potentially be sold as corporate pieces. I'm still putting that in there somehow. That's still a catalyst for me to want to get in to do that thing. What can those listening take away from your journey or your approach to creativity? I think just going back, as I was saying before, about not being scared to fail. Standards of today make you feel like, because every because art now is so public facing, right? You feel like you know, fail in front of a lot of people, but I think it's it doesn't matter. Just be because if you're brave enough to get to the point where you're going to fail at something, it it means you're going to you're you're striving for something great. And I think if you self critique yourself throughout that journey and understand what it was that was wrong about it and why it was wrong, and the next time you try it will be a, a triumph all the time. Um, and it, and it's it's hard because at the time you don't want to fail. You don't want to go into a project thinking you're going to fail, right? But I think being aware that like that's not a negative thing. Failure. I'm not saying negative failure as like you've done a bad job. But I'm saying you've hit a hurdle and you haven't known how to get over it. And it's prohibited your creative vision or your, your the, the overall piece. Only then can you go away, assimilate that and get it right the next time. And after a while, you just won't make any mistakes. You'll just be on a clean run because you would have hit those hurdles. But what you don't want to do is have a lucky streak, get your biggest project ever, hit that road bump, which would be quite easy to overcome had you known how to do it two years yeah. before. But at that moment, be like, this is actually going to derail the whole thing and ruin what I'm making because I didn't have that experience, you know, earlier on. I mean, maybe as an exercise, people need to start applying the attributes of success or the attributes they apply to success yeah. to failure and see yeah. how that changes their thinking. Exactly that. Yeah. I think just let's, let's not make failure a dirty word. Failure is not a dirty word. It's, it's a chapter one and there's a whole book. So like, don't stress, you know, where can the listeners find out more about you and your work? I'm on Instagram at, at Daniel Broadley. Um, I'm also, I have a website, danielbroadleyfilms.com. Um, I'm mostly on Instagram. If people want to reach out or email me, I'm not the sort of person who doesn't reply. I'm pretty open. I like to chat about creative stuff. So, uh, yeah, get in touch, follow me and we'll, we'll, we'll talk. Sweet. Thank you very much, Dan. It's been great talking to you. It's my pleasure, man. It's been so nice. And actually just such a, I didn't know what this is going to entail in terms of like, I knew we were going to get deep, but actually. Thanks for listening to Self Esteem. Find out more information about this week's guests in the show notes. Follow us at Self Esteem, that's S L F E S T M everywhere. And check out our website for extended interviews and more episodes. Selfesteem.com, S L F E S T M. If you like what you've heard today, please like, subscribe, and leave a rating wherever you get your podcasts and share it with your friends. It all helps. See you next episode for another journey into creativity.